Well, good morning. For those of you here who came to see Cole, I'm not Cole Mueller. I'm sorry. Uh, Cole got caught with an infection that really has got him down, folks, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, I talked to Jessica this morning briefly, and she said he's still running fever. So, uh, so keep, keep him in your prayers. When we hired Cole, we, we told him, you look, you know, if, if you need a break or, or something comes up, we've got your back. And I know he's concerned, wondering, you know, he really wants to be up here preaching and, 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 and fitting this body. And, and, but we, we wanted him to know that it's all right. If something like this comes up, it's okay. And it's going to be okay. So keep him in your prayers. Keep that family in your prayers. Uh, that uh, I don't know if the rest of the family's had this already and he's the last one in the gamut or, or they're still passing it around. But, but, but keep him in your prayers. Decisions, decisions, decisions. You know, every day we wake up in this world we're faced with situations that ask us to make decisions. You know, sometimes it's very simple situations, and the decisions become very easy. Other times, those situations may even go to the gamut of being gut-wrenching. And the decision becomes so difficult You know, the most significant decision you can make in this lifetime is to choose Jesus. Choose to follow him. This morning, for a few moments, we're going to look at some situations where people were faced with that decision, whether they were going to keep following God or they were going to reject God. The first one is found in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24. The backstory is this. The children of Israel have finally come into the promised land. By the power of God and by the leadership of Joshua, they're settled into the land of Canaan. And now Joshua looks out at these people that he's been leading and he says to them, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? He reminds them of everything that God has done for them. And remember, Joshua was one of two that was allowed, that originally came from Egypt to go into that land of Canaan. Joshua had seen it all, had been through it all. And he looks out at these people and he says, reminds them, you know what? It's been all about God. It's been all about what God has done for you, and he's brought you to this promised land. Now, what are you going to do? And this is what he said, this challenge to them. Tim, if you put the first scripture up, please. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household... We will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua understood everything that God had done. And he looked out at these people, and, and he'd been leading these people, and he knew all about these people. And he says, what, what's it going to be? You know, it's Jehovah God that brought you into this land. 
Are, are you going to go back now and serve the gods of, that your ancestors did beyond the Euphrates River? Or, or maybe, maybe you want to serve these gods that, whose land you're living in right now, the Amorites. But Joshua stands up in the middle of all those people and he says, you know what? It makes no difference who you choose. If you choose one of those other gods, I'm still going to choose Jehovah God. That's what I'm going to do. Now, you couldn't, can you imagine what would have happened if the people had stood up and rebelled against Joshua and said, No, we want to serve the, the gods of the Amorites, or we want to serve the gods of the Euphrates. See, Joshua potentially put his life on the line. But he stood with Jehovah God. And as the story kind of goes on, all the time that Joseph was still alive, and the el immediate elders that came beyond him, the children of Israel did remain faithful to Jehovah God. Second group of people we want to look at is found in the book of Daniel. The backstory of this is the children of Judah, the tribe of Judah, has been carried away into Babylonian captivity. Nebuchadnezzar's the king. He's come in and he's desolated Jerusalem and he's hauled off the best and the brightest to be slaves in his kingdom. And he goes to his chief counsel and he says, you know what, I want you to pick the best and the brightest and the best looking young men of the tribe of Judah and I want you to bring them in and I want you to train them in our language and our culture because I want them serving in my courts, in my palace. And out of that group... There was four that stood out. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know the last three better by the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because that's the Babylonian name that was given to them. And as it... As it hands out, those four stand head and shoulders above any of them that this chief trains. And so it happens during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar in his first year, he has this elaborate dream. And it disturbs him. And so he goes to all the best wise men of Babylonia and he says, you tell me what that dream is and you interpret it for me. And so he goes through all these wise men, and not one. They keep saying, well, Nebuchadnezzar, if you just tell us what the dream is, we'll, we'll, we'll interpret it for you. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no. And as it turns out, not a one of them could. And, and so he goes to his commander of the warriors, and he says, I want you to slay every one of them. Well, that comes back to Daniel, because remember, he's part of that group he comes back to that and, and Daniel goes to his three friends Hananiah Mishael and Azariah and he says pray that God will be merciful and what does God do he reveals to Daniel here here's a dream and here's the interpretation so Daniel runs to Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar he, well he, he he takes the commander, or has the commander take him to, to Nebuchadnezzar and says, I, no man can review that to you, but the God of heaven can review that, can reveal that dream and the interpretation. And he does. And so Daniel's elevated to be above all these wise men in Babylonia. And guess what he does? He brings along his three friends and says, I want them to be the ministrators under me. So think about it a minute. 
you have four Jewish foreign people that are over all the kingdom of Babylonia except for being Nebuchadnezzar. So as it goes, the second year, Nebuchadnezzar decides to build this big image, about 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and he brings in all the rulers from his whole kingdom, and he says, guess what? When you hear these instruments play, these various instruments play, I want everyone to bow down and worship this image. Well, the music plays. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't bow down. Well, the astrologers that are Babylonian get wind of that, and they think, aha, here we go. Well, now we can get back at them. So they go to Nebuchadnezzar, and they said, didn't you say when the instruments play that everyone's supposed to bow their knees to this image? Well, guess what? You got three Jewish leaders that you brought into your courts to be over this. They're not doing that. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar gets very upset. And he brings Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him and he says, didn't I give the edict that, that when these instruments play, you bow down and worship Yes, you did. We're not going to do it. Well, that infuriates the king even more. He says, I'm going to give you one more chance. One more chance. If you bow down, every, when the instruments play, everything's good, and we'll move forward. So they do. And they don't. Look at the response. Tim, you put the second scripture up, please. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into this blazing furnace, the God, is, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. You see, Nebuchadnezzar told him, I've got this blazing fire furnace going, and I'm going to throw you in there if, if, you, if you don't bow down and worship this image. In the midst of that, they look at Nebuchadnezzar and says, you know what? You can do to us whatever you want. But we are only going to serve Jehovah God. Now just stop and think. They're defying the king. So this really infuriates him now. So what does he do? He not only has that furnace blazing, he blazes it up seven times higher than it had ever been. And he takes his strongest warriors and he says, you bind these three and you throw them into that fire. And of course, what happens when the warriors get up there? They get killed by the fire because it's blazing so much. And here go Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego falling into the furnace. And what happens? You see, they were willing to go there whether God said, yes, I'll deliver you, or no, I won't. And God steps forth. And what does Nebuchadnezzar see? He says, weren't there three people we put in that fire? I see a fourth one. Where did he come from? And he looks like a son of a man. It was God showing up. 
And so he runs up there and he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out of there. And he sees not a hair was singed on their body. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no matter what you do to us physically, we will never, ever deny this Jehovah God. We'll never deny it. The third example that we're looking at is found in the book of Acts. This involves, to start out with, Peter and John. Peter and John are going to the temple. And, and when they go into the temple, it's, it's the hour of prayer. It tells us about 3 o'clock. And as they're just about to go in the gate, here comes some men carrying a lame man who was born that way from birth. Now this lame man is about 40 years old. Stop and think about that. From birth he's been like this. He's relied on people to carry him to that gate to beg for sustenance. Well, Peter looks down at him and says, and of course, the man is looking at him saying, you know, can I have some money? Can I have some money? And Peter looks at him and says, I don't have any silver or gold, but I do have something more powerful than that. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And that man, for the first time in his life, stood on his own two feet and got up and walked. Now, the crowd was astonished you know, because they, they were well aware of this 40-year-old man that was regularly there at the gate begging for money. But Peter and John didn't stop there. They, they then went about looking at the crowd and said, why are you so astonished? It wasn't me that did this. It was Jesus Christ, the one that you all crucified. He's the one that gave us the power to do this. He's the one that healed this man. Of course, this gets back to the Jewish leaders. They see all of the to-do going around the temple. And remember, this is, this is the headquarters of all Judaism at the time, right there in Jerusalem. And, and so they see this mob just going nuts. So what do they do? They pull Peter and John, put them in prison. And then, then the next morning, they bring them before themselves. And they said, what are you doing? You know, by what authority, what power do you have to be able to do that to this man? Of course, Peter... You know him, and he doesn't back down. He says, it was by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and put on the cross and killed, and he rose on the third day. Now, to the Jewish leaders, that was heresy. And so what do they do? They go and, and, and they talk amongst themselves, and they say, man, these, these are unlearned people. I mean, they're, they're just fishermen and what do they know so tell you what we'll just pull them in and, and we'll tell them look don't you don't you ever go out and preach in that name or teach in that name again look what Peter says him next scripture please but Peter and John replied which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him meaning Jesus you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Peter tells him, look, you decide whether it's right or wrong in your, in your own mind. I tell you. You decide. Am I on? I'm out backwards all right you decide you look at the situation 
and, and, and you decide for yourselves. But you know what? We've seen it. We've witnessed it for three years, and you know what? We can't help but tell people about it. And so they let him go. Fast forward a few days, and, and, and here are all the apostles now in the courtyard of the temple, and what are they doing? They're teaching about Jesus. And so what do the Jewish leaders do? They pull them all and put them in the public jail, thinking the next day they're going to pull them out and they're going to chastise them too, or, or even worse. Well, they go to the jail, and what happens? They're gone. They're not there. Where do they find them? Back in the temple courtyards again, preaching and teaching. And so they pull them this time, not before just a few Jewish leaders, but before the whole Sanhedrin council. Every Jew, Jewish leader that was anything was there. And they looked at them and said, didn't we tell you not to preach or teach in this name again? And look at what Peter says. Next scripture, Tim. Tim, next scripture, please. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in them. He said, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. This time, Peter's real direct with him. He says, I told you, you judge. But he says, you can tell us, you can kill us, you can take us before whatever council you want to, you can throw us in prison, but you know what? We're not going to obey humans. We're going to obey God, and we're going to keep teaching and preaching in this name. So what does that say to you? What do you think about when you look at these three situations? You see, all three of them had a choice. They could go over here and re reject their commitment in God and walk away and say, okay, I'm going to choose this way. I'm going to choose my way. But in every case, they chose God's way. They chose to serve Jehovah God. You know, if you're here this morning... And you've not made that choice to follow and serve God. You've made the choice to reject Him. And as long as you keep deciding not to serve God, you will keep rejecting Him. Satan in the world out there puts all this kind of allure out there that says, you know what? Life is all about pleasure. Life is all about being happy. Life is all about taking care of you. But God says, it's all about serving me. If you're here and you've not accepted Jesus, the invitation we offer every week is not my invitation or Dan or Dan's or Cole's or Gary's. It's Jesus' invitation to come follow me, to come follow him. That's what the invitation is all about. And he asks you to do one thing, and that's to come die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you made that initial commitment. Maybe you said, yes, I want to follow Jesus, but maybe some tragedy in your life has happened. If you have not yet had some serious tragedy come into your life, I promise you, it will happen sometime in this life. It may be of your own doing. It may be of something that somebody has done to you. But it will happen. And when it does happen, you've got a big question to answer, and that is, 
will I remain faithful to God or will I try to solve it and follow the world? See, the awesome thing about it is when you choose God, not only does he solve it, but he solves it in a way that's best for you and in a way that you never could do on your own. And if you've experienced that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've felt the tra- or experienced a tragedy in your life and, and God showed up because you remained faithful to him and he walked you through it, even though it was painful and even though it hurt, he still brought you out in the end in the best possible place you could be. You know, in the scripture reading, we looked at three men. The first one said, I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. And Jesus looked at him and said, you know, foxes have dens and, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. He said, are, are you really ready to follow me, even if it means leaving everything behind? The second man, Jesus looked at and said, follow me. man says, well, let me first go home and bury my father, and then I'll come follow you. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go out and proclaim the kingdom of God. See, what he was saying to that man is, your priority should be not to be concerned about the physical things of this life, but to be about proclaiming the gospel. And then the third man comes up to him and says, I'll follow you. He just, but he says, but first, let me go home and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus looks at him and says, for those of you that are a little older than I am, you may appreciate this if you've ever done this that no one who puts their hand to the plow is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus looked at him and said, you can't have it both ways. You can't be in the world and be in my kingdom. You're either all in my kingdom or you, you can't be part of my kingdom. So this morning... I don't know where you're at in your life. You may be going through a tragedy in your life right now that you need to talk to someone about and pray about. In the back will be most of the elders and their wives, and they're there. Go talk to them. Go pray with them. Maybe you need to make that initial commitment to Jesus. We used to sing a song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Are you there? If you're not, don't leave this place without choosing to follow Jesus and not looking back. Whatever we can do to help you, please make it known as we stand and sing.